Good afternoon. I welcome you all to the fall session of the Balkan Monthly Interdisciplinary Series. Thank you for being here. It's so nice to see a number of familiar faces. When it comes to these talks, I do love repeat offenders, so please do keep showing up. I wish, first of all, to acknowledge the assistance provided by, to the Balkan Monthly by the Faculty of Arts, the Office of the Dean, the Departments of History and Classics and Anthropology, and the Beard Institute for Austrian and Central European Studies. I particularly want to extend my thanks to Melanie Marvin, who is recording all this today and who was quite generous with her time, did her magic behind the scene and produced this wonderful poster for the event <coughs> and helped me organize Professor Longinovic's visit. So thanks to the benevolence of many of my colleagues and friends, we are able uh, to welcome to the University of Alberta prominent international scholars, one of which is Professor Longinovic. He graciously accepted my invitation to visit uh, with us and talk about his favorite topic uh, and elaborate on numerous fine points raised in his latest book. You can see that I have been relaxing for a while and not doing public speaking, so I'm sweating profusely and I'm quite nervous about it all. Uh, this is Professor Longinovich's second visit to the U of A, and I am particularly happy that he chose again the Balkan Monthly as a venue. So following my brief introductory remarks about his most recent monograph, which is the reason we are all here, entitled Vampire Nation, Violence as Cultural Imaginary, uh, Professor Longinovic will talk about blood and culture and offer us some variations on the vampire theme. Uh, towards the end of the session there will be a Q&A period and I'll do my best to accommodate your questions and, and comments. Those among you who wish to purchase this book could do that uh, by filling out the order at the back of the information sheet and contacting the publisher directly. So let me introduce our guest for today. Uh, Tomislav Longinovic is professor of Slavic and Comparative Literature at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. He is the author of a number of monographs such as Vampire Like Us, uh, Borderline Culture, as well as novels Sama America and Moment of Silence. He also authored numerous scholarly articles on various topics from the both Yugoslav and post-Yugoslav literary and cultural space. His most recent book is entitled Vampire Nation, Violence as Cultural Imaginary, published by the Duke University Press in 2011. Is the book. So let me say a few general comments and remarks about the book. Uh, I read it twice, couldn't put it down, and realized it is a rather sophisticated collage of literary analysis, uh, general and sometimes controversial uh, historical observations, and political commentaries related to uh, the events that occurred in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. Building on his earlier work on vampire folklore and his analysis of Nosferatu and Bram Stoker's Dracula, Professor Longinovich turns his analytical lens towards the relationship between the vampire discourse and contemporary culture and international politics as they relate to the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. So the vampire nation is also an analysis of the works of the Yugoslav literary giants such as Ivo Andrić, Mesha Selimovic, Daniel Lokish, Borislav Pekic, as well as uh, one of the most prominent post-Yugoslav authors, David Albahari, who is our fellow Albertan, has been for the better part of the last 20 years. Uh, their works, in different ways, of course, and uh, in different temporal frameworks, uh, address the processes of deconstructing reconstructing and destroying of hybrid identities in the former Yugoslav space. Uh, Loginovic's review of Ivo Andrić's works inspired me to revisit the works of this Nobel laureate, 
uh, after a pause of some 20 odd years or so. And I am particularly grateful to our guest for you know, ever so gently nudging me into reading, or rereading rather, uh, some of the best narratives of the Yugoslav literary space. In his careful examining of, as he put it, and I quote, the legacy of resistance and opposition in the realm of culture, Loginovich pays particular attention to the works of David Albahari and uh, knowing Albahari's uh, writing uh, quite well, I could attest that uh, the analysis of Professor Loginovich is among the best and most sophisticated decoding of the works of this uh, prominent post-Yugoslav author. Uh, this book is also an examination of the constructing and projecting uh, the image of the Serbs as vampires by the Western media and political establishments during the 1990s at the time of the Yugoslav dissolution. It is an inquiry into how, as Professor Longinovich puts it, the military media complex used the specter of the bloodthirsty Serbs as a simulacrum for the target practice of its own strategic performance of military humanitarianism, end of quote. So, Professor Loginovich argues that during the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, the global PR uh, industry and media outlets had singled out the Serbs as, the, as main culprits and profiled them, as he put it, as avatars of post-communist violence in the Balkans, portrayed them as representatives of uh, the so-called cruel Orient of Europe. While analyzing this process, the author offers us numerous commentaries and historical qualifications, some of which are bound to raise questions among historians and uh, political scientists specializing in the South Slavic space, history, and culture. This is particularly true for those commentaries of recent events, or relatively recent events, that call for more substantial support by primary sources and documentary evidence. In the words of one reviewer, readers would find a lot to chew on in this book indeed. So considering the political nature, inevitably, I guess, uh, of his writing, Longinovich's Vampire Nation could be viewed also as a part of a debate uh, about the nature of the Yugoslav collapse and the role Serbian political and military leadership played in it. Even though this book emerges at the Maybe it's not a fair way to describe it, but a tail end of this uh, debate, its contribution to it is by no means marginal because uh, the author both revisits and then revives the, uh, a number of controversial issues surrounding the Yugoslav breakup and invites the reader to re-examine existing historical narratives. Uh, most importantly, at least in, in my estimation, this book reminds us how counterproductive it is actually to think about the causes of the Yugoslav breakup uh, in terms of guilt and innocence as absolute categories, which is incidentally something uh, that post-conflict national narratives in every Yugoslav successor state uh, are desperately trying to do and building those narratives uh, on. So in summary, this book confirms that in the Balkans people uh, eat memory for breakfast indeed, and that history, ma imagination, and myth-making efforts are alive and well among these scattered pieces of what used to be former Yugoslavia. So with that, I pass the mic to uh, our esteemed guest, Professor Tomislav Longinovich, who will no doubt uh, further elaborate on some of these themes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio, for a wonderful introduction. Um, and you know, yes, indeed, it is a heavy topic. You know, you know and I hopefully I will you know close this chapter of my scholarly career and writing about Yugoslavia and its ends with this book. Although it's something that keeps coming back, you know, to haunt me, so to speak, in this kind of gothic spirit, you know, of the book itself. Um, so, you know, to start, you know, from the cover, um, you know, of the book and, you know, that 
and in, in my use of vampire as a sort of cover also. Uh, because um, the book came about uh, through my collaboration with the late Neil Whitehead, uh, one of my dear friends and collaborators who passed away uh, in um, March last year suddenly, and who was actually the general editor of um, the series at Duke University Press uh, uh, that is entitled uh, uh, Violence uh, as its Culture and Practice. And we actually had a research circle at the University of Wisconsin that was uh, basically dealing with um, sexuality and violence and their various uses, misuses, and abuses you know, throughout the cultural space, and also challenging both conservative and liberal assumptions about violence you know, as well. So um, I use basically the cover of the vampire in, in effect to talk about nationalism. Um, and the vampire, for some reason, is a popular cultural icon that attracts so much attention that Duke agreed to publish it. So, you know, I, I managed to pass that uh, by. So the book is uh, an attempt to use popular culture, basically, in order to understand nationalism. And uh, nationalism, not just as a phenomenon that reaches, um, you know, politics and history, but goes beyond politics. It, it's kind of a... Uh, violence uh, and its structure and how it is, you know, penetrating the imaginary of various peoples. So, and I should say a, a bit about myself and as a scholar that my first degree was in psychology. So, a lot of the terms that I use, you know, in the book are inspired by psychological research and psychoanalysis, especially by um, Jacques Lacan and his um, basically um, French revision of Freud. Um, also by Jacques Derrida and his deconstructive approach to um, um, reading of philosophy, and also Gilles Deleuze and uh, Félix Guattari and their approach, um, also known as nomadology. So in many ways, you know, uh, historians will probably be uh, a little irked by my arguments because I tend to stretch uh, the, uh, the facts and I tend to conform them to my arguments. And, I actually try to examine not what reality is, but what are actually the structures of the imagination that are operative you know, in certain situations of conflict and violence. So oftentimes I will you know, stretch you know, historical facts just to accommodate that. Um, and the front page cover is um, basically from Cele Kula. This is a skull tower um, that was erected in um, Serbia by the Ottomans after one of the battles uh, that took place there and during the first Serbian uprising and in which there was basically a collective suicide of the Serbian warriors that were, you know, sort of uh, held uh, against the much greater Ottoman power and could not, um, you know, really sustain and they wanted to avoid torture so they, their leader blew them uh, up. So the Turks actually you, you took their heads, chopped them off, built a tower as a warning um, to the other Serbs not to rebel against the empire. And it, was, it is very interesting that after the liberation of Serbia, this monument was supposed to act as a kind of a scarecrow to intimidate the um, local population, then becomes like the centerpiece of one of the national monuments to martyrdom and memory. So how the same objects by passing from one political and historical formation to the other gets entirely different meaning. So that's I, how I used it. And it, because it, in some ways it embodies also my attempt to speak about this phenomenon from both the side of the local you know, and the global and critique both positions at the same time, which is you know, a formidable task. I'll never undertake it again because it, it creates this controversial article, um, arguments. Um, so basically it is about the politics of memory, use and abuses of the past, you know, and how it is used. So it's not specifically historical, but it's, it is about the uses of the past. And it, is, it was really inspired by uh, Daniel Kish, you know, um, one of the authors that I greatly admire and I used a little bit in the book. And his 1978 book called The Anatomy Lesson, um, which is basically a deconstructive take on the nationalism in the former Yugoslavia after he was attacked by uh, certain literary circles in Belgrade. So mm, he also takes up nationalism there already in, 19, in, in the late 1970s and 
is very clairvoyant about stuff that is going to start happening there in the 1990s. It's kind of incredible. He died in 89 and didn't live to see it, and I'm probably grateful for that. So the, the aim was to take apart the nationalist-based ba understanding of culture locally, you know, meaning in the local context of you know, Serbia and the former Yugoslavia, but also to extend that gaze beyond and look at the global um, you know, gaze at Yugoslavia and how it itself is informed by a certain nationalism and a certain um, vampiric exploitative gaze. So on the one hand, it is devoted to discovering the cultural mechanisms operating among the Serbs as these kind of new vampires of the new world order and at the same time also analyzing the um, new masters of the global domain, the US-led West, sort of both sides. And it's very difficult to articulate the position in between in which you critique both at the same time um, because both sides will immediately find arguments against you. So it, it is kind of a losing proposition from the very start. Uh, the project itself, you know, came about, actually it has connection to Canada because uh, in the middle 90s, the Canada Council offered um, a project to Linda Fatchen and Mario Valdez at the University of Toronto uh, to write a comparative uh, literary history, basically, of the entire world. Uh, and, you know, I was part of the section devoted to Eastern Europe. And when I was put in charge of the section called the temporal nodes, and when I started thinking what would be the best kind of image to represent East European understanding of time, I came up with the image of the vampire. Um, and vampire, you know, and I will talk about it a little more in detail later. Um, so temporal nodes, so it is not basically uh, uh, the usual understanding of, of time that is offered by history and chronology. But as it says here, the research that allows for multiple non-hierarchical entry and exit points in representation and interpretation of cultural phenomena. Also, it is a kind of interpretation that resists causality that's established along chronological lines and history and culture are seen basically as networks of attractions and influences in a very fluid way. This also is very much inspired by the nomadological approach of Deleuze and Guattari, you know, in, in the way they are attempting to write in this kind of new manner. So, you know, basically prompted by this post-structuralist um, understanding of, of culture, um, I came basically to this uh, vampire as a sort of metaphor for East European temporality. And why is that? Because this is one of the paradoxes of modernization, you know, especially when applied to this region. Um, we see the Balkan nations uh, and their fixation, uh, especially the smaller they are, uh, they get fixated on their past and establishing their identity you know, in some ancient horizon that is way out of reach of you know, modernity. And this is one of the sort of major things that we see in historiography of all the East European uh, nations. So um, blood as the fluid medium of the national imaginary also, something that you know during the age of nationalism is seen as a common bond between the su national subjects and that can be then extended into this ancient past and we always are trying to find the seamless narratives that are connecting us to the ancient times and whatnot. So, it is interesting that the vampire in its first articulation in literature, for example, Nosferatu um, and in film, um, is always carrying a bit of soil in his coffin when he travels everywhere. And because he needs blood to sustain it, we have exactly the kind of Germanic, um, or I should say, um, ethnic understanding of nationalism, the blood and soil you know, that connects people and bonds them together. Of course, this understanding of nationalism is opposed to the more legalistic, what we can say, kind of French-American one um, that is much more tied to the civic uh, respect for the institution, the law, and the constitution of a certain country. Um, the other thing is that I discovered is this kind of enlightenment roots um, of nationalism, kind of very interesting um, 
and simultaneous uh, emergence uh, of the nation as a dominant political organization um, around the 18th century, and the simultaneous tremendous interest basically in the vampires as a, a, as a phenomenon at first of you know, scientific value, which is kind of interesting and surprising. Um, the, um, Rousseau basically wrote this in 1762, you know, mentions vampires in his social contract, which is rather interesting, um, as a reaction to the vampire plagues, um, you know, which um, basically raged in the southern provinces of the Habsburg Empire between 1725 and 40, 1740. Um, and it is very interesting that these were the regions that were populated by the freshly exiled Serbs from the Kosovo after the Austro-Ottoman Wars. And that you know, these peoples uh, were observed um, by the Hasbro administrators as carrying out these strange rituals. When there would be a plague in the village, either you know, some cattle disease or a plague among the population, um, they would be seen going to the graveyard and looking you know, at the graves. They had various tests as to see where the vampire resides. Um, and the vampire would be blamed basically for this um, epi epidemic, let's say. So despite that, um, and, and during this period, there was about 30 to 40 doctoral dissertation on the topic of vampirism at you know, European universities during the 18th century. Um, Raging you know, in Leipzig, in Vienna, in um, Paris, and so forth. So it's very interesting that the first interest then in the vampires was scientific. And Rousseau in this quote actually you know, um, goes on to actually um, de um, critique it as a superstition. As he says here, if there is in this world a well-attested account, it is that of vampires, nothing is lacking. Official reports, affidavits of well-known people, of surgeons, of priests, of magistrates. The judicial proof is most complete, and with all that, who is there who believes in vampires? So it's sort of an interesting thing, you know, that he applies with this uh, doubt and reason to this um, kind of pseudo-scientific examination of vampires. And I find this also very interesting and resonating with kind of my main thesis about the creation through the media of this image of the Serbs as vampires. So he did, he, his disbelief in consensus uh, in, um, yet at the same time he feels that there is some sort of uncanny presence of vampire um, that comes about with the rise of industrial capitalism. And it is interesting also how the idea develops. Um, it, first in the 18th century, it is scientific. Then after the, the critique and the revolution in France, it becomes more literary. And throughout the 19th century, it culminates, of course, with the Gothic literature. And then in the 20th century, it becomes exclusively cinematic. And then in the 21st, it becomes very much televisual and media. And there is this huge explosion of interest um, through the Twilight Saga and the Vampire Diaries and so on um, nowadays, which very much interests me why is it like that. And of course, um, you know, in the 19th century, you know, it was Marx uh, who also used the vampire metaphor and you can kind of see how the metaphor itself seeps into the public discourse and into, you know, his writing. And he basically says it's uh, sort of a dead, you know, labor uh, capital, I mean, uh, something that vampire-like lives only by sucking living labor, lives the more, the more labor it sucks, sort of kind of his diagnosis of how the, you know, human alienation is taking place within the industrial capitalist system in many ways. And in the 19th century, you know, the, it becomes very prevalent metaphor. For example, um, in this sort of image from England, the um, you know Charles Parnell and uh, the Irish National League. This is circa 1854. Is you know Parnell is shown as the vampire, you know, preying on Ireland, and um, because of his demands for home rule, you know, for Ireland, and he is basically seen as a vampire in the eyes of the British Crown, which is very interesting. And Ireland is seen as kind of defenseless, prostrate female whose blood is desired by the nationalists in Ireland. 
So it's very interesting how it is used in the discourse of nationalism against the crown, you know, for example, at this time. And it's interesting also to know that there is this kind of Irish and Balkan connection, this kind of two peripheries of Europe in which you see this repertoire of um, violent vampiric images displayed sort of openly, you know, and you don't see it that much in the centers of it. And of course, with that, we, we come to the probably most influential uh, you know, book in the terms of the literary imaginary, you know, which is Bram Stoker's Dracula, published in 1897, sort of the pillar of Gothic sort of literature that comes at the end of it. And uh, it is very interesting that uh, even within uh, literary works you know, uh, of the Gothic period, we have some sort of presence already of you know, Eastern Europe as um, this sort of zone um, that the vampire thrives, for example. And um, one of the most interesting quotes that I take in my book from Dracula is this one. Uh, when was redeemed that great shame of Kosovo when the flags of the Vlach and the Magyar went down beneath the crescent? Who was it but one of my own race who has voivoded across the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground? This was a Dracula, indeed. Uh, so it's sort of interesting how in this quote you, we have Dracula as this kind of holy warrior fighting for the cross, which is totally contradictory to what we see in the movies, where Dracula is afraid of the cross and runs away from it. But suddenly in this quote he appears as sort of this anti-Muslim warrior um, almost like a Chetnik kind of guy, which is very interesting because, you know, at this time um, there was a lot of anti-Ottoman, um, um, you know, warriors, you know, in the mountains, both in Greece and in Bulgaria and in Serbia and Macedonia and so on. Uh, and probably he was inspired by these sort of reports, you know, that were coming from that part of the world and conflated them somehow with his historical study of the, you know, the count. And he was very much inspired by his um, um, friendship with one of the professors of actually um, Ottoman history, you know, at the University of Oxford. So, you know, sort of some of the themes that, you know, I take up in the book. You know, first of all, vampire is symptomatic of um, European, but particularly East European temporality, what I already talked about, this kind of ancient time that is um, sort of encapsulated, you know, in the national imaginary, and, you know, um, this constant stretching of the time backwards. You know, that's one of these established themes. The other one that Gothic literature from now on seems, uh, uh, serves as a sort of epistemological paradigm for um, viewing the Balkans, for, for um, visualizing it sort of in the media. And that visualization becomes and transforms it into the kind of exemplary zone of you know, blood and soil of, blood, of the bloody being. That, you know, from then on, Balkan is always going to be sort of um, you know, informed by this uh, epistemological lens you know, through which it is viewed from the outside especially from the west of Europe. One interesting example is during the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, um, there was um, a first time that actually we had a newsreel, um, you know, people going down and, and shooting actually news that were shown in front of, uh, before the movie, um, the feature films. And uh, there was a case of a, of a, uh, a British filmmaker in 1912, uh, who comes with his Dutch cameraman to a site of the battle that has already taken place. And he basically doesn't want to go back empty handed. So he sort of asks the villagers to kind of take up arms and start pretending to shoot at each other so that he can have some footage to show when he gets back. And I thought that's very also symptomatic of the whole sort of situation, you know, that there. Um, especially how the media information complex then later manages, you know, the footage of the complex and how this kind of so-called CNN effect the world 
uh, that actually came into being during the Yugoslav Wars, you know, comes to inform our public opinion, political decision making, and so on. Something that we should always be aware of. So a little bit, basically, you know, about sort of the book itself and its structure. Uh, it, it sort of starts with um, the, uh, the uh, uh, chapter called Violence in Translation, the Vampire Metaphor in the Age of Nationalism. Uh, and it, it really does discuss um, this um, way in which, you know, so the, the media information, the military complex informs a, a view of the world. I'm sort of, by the way, also very concerned that what we are seeing and how we're visualizing the conflict in Syria is reminding me so much of the, what we, are, we were seeing 20 years ago in Yugoslavia. Um, so I will just read a few parts you know, from this chapter and the following five chapters now. So, so personally, I was fascinated by the ability of the mediatized gaze to translate the random acts of violence in the name of territorial identity throughout the former Yugoslavia into similarly tried formulas of ethnic cleansing. This fascination was extremely painful since the Gothic timber of reporting from the Yugoslav war zones was also Im implicating its varied peoples as the reincarnations of the ancient creature residing in their own particular version of Geistschloss. Geistschloss is the, you know, this Dracula's castle. Mm -hmm. The fantasy of this immaculate national body fed by blood of those who stood in its way was projected by, the, projected by the media onto the events fueled by the same global, global hunger for one's own territory and resources as Yugoslav politicians abandoned the common socialist dream in favor of ruthless privatization which concentrated all the wealth in the hands of a few post-communist families. And this is the process we see everywhere in the so-called transition. So redeploying the move of Jean-Francois Lyotard in his essay on Heidegger and the Jews, I used the common noun and quotation marks in an attempt to disarm both warring cultures. So I write the serves with a small letter and with single quotes uh, to show this kind of imaginary construct. On the one hand, the largest Balkan national entity needs to surrender the cultural weapons it imagined as the essence of its collective identity during the emergence from Islamic slavery in the course of the 19th century. On the other, the public within the US-led West needs to understand the way in which the media complex uses the Serbs as a target for the practice of its own strategic performance of military humanism. So the use of the common noun and quotation marks to qualify the collective identity of a ethnic group marks the departure from any notion of the nation as an essential, monumental, and historically stable category. The use of these markers serves to distinguish the Serbs, an imaginary assemblage of dubious veracity, from the practice of everyday life of those humans who happen to be born under the sign of national belonging. And I always like think of you know retired uh, professors you know digging through the garbage cans that you know I see there when I go to visit often. Without attempting to excuse any of the real war crimes committing during the wars of the Yugoslav succession and the NATO cost of intervention. So this text analyzes different cultural mechanisms responsible for the framing of the Serbs as post-communist vampires after the Cold War. So this is sort of like the introductory little chapter. So the next one is basically um, you know, analyzing this kind of whole mechanism uh, the f chapter number one, and from it I will quote something that actually used another quote from Ro Lawrence Rickles, um, who uses the psychoanalytic mechanism of projection to account for the schizoid split at the very root of the cultural imaginary haunted by violence in Europe. Mm -hmm. The force of perpetual mutual devouring caused by the hunger of this unrecognized underside of being is at the bottom of European identity. And I quote from Rickles. Even as I attack Eastern Europe, it is the East that threatens to attack the West. It is not we who are actively colonizing and in fact cannibalizing the East. It is the East that is packed with animals and subhumans 
whose drive westward we must stop in our tracks back east. The threat, embodied for example as vampirism, always comes from the east, from Eastern Europe for example, even when at all times it is the west that is doubling over with hunger, in the end of quote. So this oral fantasy of devouring incorporation uh, present in blood sucking of the vampire is not limited to the subhuman nation of the Serbs, but represents the violent origin repressed by any imagined community within the symbolic extensions of Europe. Both colonial and Eastern others provide an ideal cultural screen for the projection of the eternal hunger of the vampire dormant within the West itself, spreading from its European roots into its colonial domains. According to Rickles, others are often imagines imagined as agents of that eternal being intent of robbing us of the precious life force that defines both our individual and group identity. If we don't act first and preempt our own loss by consuming the other first, the other, uh, his otherness threatens to lodge itself deeply within us and taint the blood and race with illicit desires of the vampire. During the 1990s, the global power of the US-led West was forced through the military intervention as a result of the cultural profiling of the Serbs as post-communist vampires. Acting out the repressed origins of national unconscious, a locus where the secrets of violence and sexuality are openly displayed as the traumatic effect of those quote-unquote old centuries that Dracula mentions in his, uh, that Stoker mentions in his Dracula. This cultural type of cultural imaginary is enacted as a form of violence. So this is just like a little bit of the you know, introductory chapter and then I go into sort of the deeper analysis of you know, the Serbian um, epic and oriental tradition and how the kind of notions of uh, man, manhood and masculinity are formed um, you know, during the um, you know, kind of pre-literate forms of culture and how then they are used you know, by the West. And I discuss very much the work of Albert Lord and Mil Milman Perry in their uh, work in, in their book, The Singer of Tales, where they talk about the epic folk singing you know, in the Balkans, one of the most commonly known things about um, the Balkans in literature and accepted into the world canon of literature. So, um, for the Serbs, the participation in the oral performance about the epic world of nightly duels was uh, complemented by the rituals of the declining Orthodox Christianity and the unwitting preservation of many Slavic pagan forms of culture. The Dinari culture, shared by these religiously divided uh, populations hardened by poverty, hardship, and exile, found its common voice in the injured masculinity of its members who go together to sing of shared pain and plot the revenge for the injustices done to their community in the past. The Christian iconography of the divine received through the process of conversion by the Byzantine missionaries assimilated an older conception of the divine among the Serbs tied to the underworld of subaltern destiny they were forced to populate while living in their Islamic billet. So in his landmark study, The Singer of Tales, Albert Lord posits the formulaic theory of Yugoslav oral verse making, tracing its origin back to the Homeric roots in classical Greece. By stressing the formal side of particular formulas of oral composition, Lord completely ignores the, and displaces the post oriental cultural context in, engendered during the Islamic rule in the Balkans. Alongside his teacher, Milman Perry, Lord research took place in the Dinaric region where the tradition of Guslar singing, and you see one of the Guslars here on the picture, originates in the obsessive repetition of past traumas, which are mourned in male company to invoke at least two competing interpretations of the Ottoman rule in the Balkans. However, whether Muslim or Christian, the singer of tales performs his heroic epic as a form of masculine lament, focused on the loss of some abstraction that Freud uh, speaks about in his work on mourning and melancholia. Uh, both ethnicities are transformed into a narrative focused on accounting for the consequence of Islamic military domination, which splits the population into the faithful subjects of Islam and the Raya, 
the Christian serfs who remain marked as inferior, inferior during their death, you know, during the Ottoman times. For the nationalist imaginary uh, of the Serbs, the epic formula adumbrates the loss of sovereignty and submission to the Islamic rule. Um, Islamic other as the most archaic core of identity that transforms masculinity into a perpetual weapon of revenge. The scar tissue left over after the glorious defeat at Kosovo functions as the messianic horizon of heroic masculinity, longing to regain the abstraction of Europe lost but not forgotten. So in order to be accepted as properly European, a 19th century nation had to prove both to its members and to its others that it is ancient, forged in blood and sacrifice, rooted in time older than time, disappearing in its own dark origins. So the ability of Guslars to perform the memory of old centuries in the present finds its cultural expression in the dinaric traditional Gusla singing, stored and transmitted mainly by the Serbs, but also by their converted Islamic brethren, who sang for Milan Perry and Albert Lord in the interwar Yugoslav province of Sanjak Novi Pazar during the 1930s. The heroic song was posited by Lord as a purely formal concern based on his classical research into the mechanisms of oral verse making. Mm -hmm. So his encounter with Avdo Mejidovic, uh, I think this is Avdo on the picture here, and other native bards was mediated by this orientation towards the formal aspects of the performance. The ability of those old singers to sit and spin the epic desiterats, this casyllabic line, for hours on end uh, had led Lord to posit his formulaic te uh, theory of oral verse making by completely ignoring the political context within which it took, it took place. So it's sort of an interesting way in which the West can sort of take out uh, the historical context and just focus on the formal aspects you know, of uh, verse making. So, um, Sounds of Blood, Yugoslavism, and its discontents. This is sort of the third part of the book. And you know, this is kind of taking up, um, although I put a slide of Milosevic speaking to the Kosovo Serbs here, uh, it, it really is talking about the interwar period and sort of the ways um, in which the um, identity is reformulated during this period. So another complication uh, in understanding the relationship between blood and song is added by half a century of military party dictatorship that imposed itself under the title of communism in the region. After the emergence of Tito and the Communist Party as the leaders of socialist Yugoslavia, uh, Dvorniković's integralist theory was seen as reactionary since it glossed over ethnic particularities. And Vladimir Dvorniković was one of the self-styled ethnopsychologists who worked in the um, you know, interwar period, and who posited this kind of idea of bringing and merging all the Yugoslav, all the Yugoslav ethnic groups together into one sort of Yugoslav nation, and of course the communists critique that and they wanted to keep particularities in place. So Yugoslavia was no longer defined as a concept founded on the projection of common dinaric race and blood shared by the Bosniaks, Croats, Montenegrins, and Serbs, but as a project which emerged from the common struggle against fascist occupation and the class interest of workers and peasants joined in a national liberation struggle during World War II. The troubled history of racism uh, fueled by Hitler's doctrines transformed the 1941 independent state of Croatia into a mass extermination site for Serbs, Jews, and Gypsies as humans of lesser quality. This overlooked aspect of non-German Nazi Holocaust is what determined the complicated identity of the populations the West has termed as Croatian Serbs, uh, Bosnian Serbs. These populations have been racialized as victims of the Croat Ustaše who implemented their notorious solution of the Serbian problem by thirds, one third exterminated, one third converted to Roman Catholicism, one third expelled from the territories of Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Those quote unquote borderline Serbs who survived the Holocaust were brought up on communist ideology and hatred of fascism, a term that originally lumped together Croat Ustash and Nazi Germans, fascist Italians, but later came to include the entire world of Western imperialism in the ide ideological discourse of the communists. These two populations of the Serbs contributed more than 
anyone during Tito's national liberation struggle against foreign occupation and domestic traders since they were directly exposed to genocide in World War II. So this Dinari culture that I'm trying to describe here is probably the most volatile one in terms of this blood and soil ideology. After World War II, communist propaganda never properly addressed the problem of mutual slaughter, uh, making collective grievances almost impossible to openly work through in terms of conflict resolution. Tito's soft totalitarianism imposed the official ideology of brotherhood and unity, which managed to suppress dissidents and discussion in any direction. That is why the Serbs in Bosnia and Croatia saw any move towards the breakup of Yugoslavia as a return of fascism and implemented their own preemptive version of genocidal revenge on Bosniak and Croat populations in the beginning of the latest wars. The Slovene call for Europe from the Alpine Heights resounded with frightening clarity in the blood of those whose ancestors were sacrificed on the altar of Hitler's new European order. So this is something that never gets really addressed in the media, so I try to articulate at least that part of the ideological uh, story from their side. Um, so this is the, uh, you know, part that discusses the sort of literary legacy in more detail, you know, in modern terms of Andrzej and Selimovic especially. And uh, this is the one that was mentioned by, by Sergei in his introduction. And it, you know, depicts this kind of impalement scene that is sort of the central scene of uh, Ivo Andrzej's The Bridge on the Drina. And I'll read just one part you know, from that chapter. The building of the bridge is symbolic of imperial domination for the subjugated populations. The violent force preventing the negotiation of cultural differences to the imposition of the Islamic millet system of religious apartheid. The torture of the peasant ordered by the Islamic masters serves as an image that will feed the hatred and produce, quote unquote, the Serbs as they imagine their collective suffering identity in the wake of loss and exile from the imaginary realm of Kosovo. During this horrendous spectacle, Radisav is gradually transformed into a Christ-like figure, a martyr, who enables the community to articulate its experience of historical victimization by the masters. And the quote, straight and naked to the waist, hands and legs tied, with head thrown back against the stake, that figure no longer looked like a human body that grows and decays but seen more like an erect, hard, and timeless statue that would remain there forever, end of quote. So this is a kind of image that is lodged in this nationalist imaginary and that will keep coming back in the forms of violence. So this monumental erection continues to haunt the collective imaginary of the Serbs to this day as a kind of death mask of collective identity. The fear and rage of the victim dominate the urge to responsibility when confronted with the image of its own sacrifice enabling the nation to describe this type of violence as the origin of its cultural imaginary in writing down its stories. Radisav, and that's the name of the peasant, his impalement sort of desublimates the narrative at the traumatic core of the nation, relating back to the theory about the aggressive undercurrent of the subject involved in the retention elimination dilemma of the anal character favored by Freud's psychoanalysis. Okay, I won't read this part. It, it goes too much into the kind of anal imagery. So you, you, you can get the book and read it. Um, but it is you know, kind of interesting that you know, it is, you know, the impalement goes kind of through the anus and, and, you know, and goes through the, through the mouth. You know, and I think this is, is very um, symptomatic of the way in which the, you know, the body is kind of dismembered and used uh, and you know, a later you know, um, signifies a certain amount of extra humiliation you know, to, in this process. And so this brings us to today's date, you know, and how we originally planned this event, which is sort of October 5th, um, you know, and uh, for those of you who remember why, the Serbian October Revolution took place uh, on the of the new millennium, of the new millennium um, uh, 12 years ago, on October 5th, uh, 2000, when Milosevic was ousted. Uh, and you know now these 12 years in 2012 actually seem very far away, I have to say. 
and everything that I was in a way trying to sort of dispel in my book um, actually started taking place in Serbia in May 2012, where we actually now actually literally have the kind of like nationalist socialist regime in Serbia with uh, Tomislav Nikolic as, as the president and uh, Ivica Dacic as the prime minister. So one is from the nationalist party, one is from the socialist party. So put together, they create nationalist socialism. Um, and so all the struggles that the uh, you know people who were in the opposition, in the Otpor movement, um, and you know, with the help of us abroad, were trying to forge, have been somehow been suppressed and have not managed to transform the country in these last 12, 12 years. And it is a very sad and tragic consequence. It's perhaps no coincidence then that the current president of Serbia used to be a grave digger before being called upon to enter politics. Um, you know, the graves of empires staking, it all kind of meshes together in this cultural imaginary. So the primary cultural task after the October 2000 uh, ousting arrest and trial, I wrote in the book, um, of the former political star, Slobodan Milosevic, uh, was to effectively work through the legacy of violence and confront the protagonists of national infamy and state terror that shrouded the Serbs with this dark cloak of cultural vampires during the long and gothic decade of the 1990s. Disputing the need to view the national memory as an expression of perpetual return of violence, the new vision of national identity ought to make sense of the recent past, both in its local and global cultural incarnations. Those global forces that united the West to face the crimes of ethnic passion never managed to uphold the high moral ground themselves, preoccupied with their own version of the original Gothic response. So Nighthawks, Stealths, Phantoms, just the name of the military machinery used to invade the heavens above the Serbs to deterritorialize de Kosovo as a locus of cr cr crucial national emergence for the vampire nation. The neo-Gothic flying machines mark the establishment of a single global empire that turned to the notion of human rights as an instrument for the affirmation of its own military supremacy. The territory of Kosovo, the most ancient of symbolic habitats of national death in life, inhabited by the specters of violence and vampires of memory, was now lost forever to yet another heavenly force, the one that resolutely turned against the imaginary empire of the Serbs. So. And um, some other articulations of the vampire, kind of more cheerful ones, were the kind of attempts to use basically the, this vampire legacy as a sort of cultural resource to attract the tourists. It's kind of very interesting things that are happening mm -hmm. in the 2000s. Um, so Sava Savanovic, you know, who basically is a uh, literary character from the you know, story by Milovan Glišić um, called uh, 90 Years Later, uh, you know, that takes place somewhere in the mountains near Valjevo is now slowly being kind of marketed as a kind of unnatural resource, so to speak, uh, you know, of, of Serbia, you know, so people can go to Valjevo and visit the old mill in which he was supposed to show up and so on and so forth. And we have similar attempts throughout uh, the former Yugoslavia. There is Jure Grando in Istria, in the small town of, of Kringa, you know, that is like the first mentioned vampire in, in history by name. And, you know, there is also an attempt to turn him into an unnatural resource and attract people to come there as tourists. Uh, so very interesting. And then some strange and weird performances, you know, that took place on March 3rd, 2007. An unusual event took place at the gravesite of Slobodan Milosevic uh, on the anniversary of his death in the prison of the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. Miroslav Milosevic, a photographer unrelated to the former president and war crime suspect, despite the same last name, visited the Graham armed with a hot iron stake after midnight and performed the ritual quieting of the vampire. He also wrote in the memory book next to the grave, quote, dark to dark, he is buried in the dark. It is midnight in the time of vampires. Uh, end of quote. He called the police 
to warn them of his deed, but the police didn't even show up and they just told him with the symptomatic jokes, be careful, Sloba's hand might get you from the grave. So this performance of the photographer, uh, who is a member of the opposition group Otpor, during the popular revolt against the Milosevic government, was to ensure that the history and memory of the times enveloped in nationalist hatred do not return to haunt Serbia ever again. Although the performance of the photographer has definite elements of folkloric parody, it is symptomatic of the struggles of those trying to defy and resist the spectral force of the Serbs had to wage both against the internal violence of the cultural imaginary and the global cultural misunderstanding, which classified them as a race of modern and vampires feeding on the blood of their ethnic others. So this statement, for example, made by Peter Justino, a distinguished actor, director and writer acting as a UNESCO ambassador is symptomatic of this type of labeling that took place in the 90s. Quote, <clears throat> animals use their resources in a much happier way than those evil creatures, the Serbs, whose membership in the human race is seriously overdue, end of quote. So this kind of interesting subhuman dimension ascribed to the entire population exemplifies this kind of racist echoes characterizing the global hysteria of the 1990s. And it's sort of interesting that in a way, paradoxically, it did help Slovan Milosevic to discredit any form of opposition and implicit co as implicit collaborators with the West. Um, because, you know, they would say, yes, look, they look at the, they see you as vampires. Is that what you're fighting for? And so, in a sense, it kind of prevented actually any change from taking place. So, and for the end, you know, this is basically the uh, Slobodan and the vampire, um, you know, thing, you know, showing this kind of ambiguous uh, victory sign uh, from the grave. So, uh, considering the current state, you know, of Serbia, uh, I, I just wonder for the, for the end of the presentation, is this actually ironic or does it really describe the state of the nation? So, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lonjunovic. Uh, I open the floor for questions and comments. Feel free to ask anything you want to follow. I won't bite, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> I see you around the back. Nobody wants to come in the first two rows. Now I know why. Uh -huh, please. It's a very good question. I mean, I also struggled with with, um, with, um, with this, and I did actually start out with you know from from Lacan, uh, because you know for him, sort of the imaginary is this sort of first stage of human development, uh, which in which there is no kind of uh, so-called symbolic order, you know, that intrudes and creates some sort of order, but it is actually this kind of mumble jumble of partial objects that are. You know, um, you know, battling in, inside the child's, you know, you know, consciousness. So I, I kind of try to present actually the uh, national imaginary as exactly such, uh, you know, construct in in terms of the Serbian nation. That they are not presented with some sort of sort of rational choice, and nationalism is not something that you elect, but you are kind of immersed in this violent imaginary. Um, of um, you know severed heads and um, you know you know violent becomings. You are uh, taught through this epic poetry that I mentioned uh, how actually you as a each new, especially male member uh, of 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 the collective, are immediately almost dead and a sacrifice. You know when called upon by your leaders to you know die for the cause and so on and so forth. 
while on the other hand, you know, women are exclusively seen as kind of reproductive machinery, you know, of the nation that are bearing sons, you know, in order to be um, brought to the altar of the nation. For example, I mean, this would be one of these imaginary constructs. So I try to adapt kind of Lacan's uh, notion a little bit to, you know, this present situation of, of what I was writing about at the time. I did also uh, mention uh, Benedict Anderson, um, you know, but of course he used it in an entirely different, in an entirely different manner. Um, you know, and for him it's kind of forging this kind of horizontal connection between the people who are immersed in print culture, right? You know, so it's, it's much more of a conscious thing, you know, and I really wanted to, to pay attention more to this kind of unconscious <coughs> constructs that are, I think, very operative because I don't think that rational choice theory can actually explain very well <coughs> the political power of nationalism. I think it's exactly in these kind of interpolated forms of behavior in which people act a certain way because they are called upon because they were at a very early age inculcated with this type of violent images. And so, so hopefully my work will be one of the channels if people actually will translate it back home, you know, to, um, you know, to sort of start the process of undoing it. You know, so. Yeah. so the Serbs were portrayed, portrayed as uh, evil nation, as vampires by Westerners, mm -hmm. US and others. What was the Serbs' response to this? <coughs> My first question, mm -hmm. and how did the Russian media and public sphere react to such evils of Serbs? Mm -hmm. This is a great question, uh, and you know, it, it seems it's it's very interesting. There, are of course, various responses, you know, all across the board. Um, you know, and some people, you know, you know, very very hard to try to rationally explain that it is not so. Um, you know, there is, was a margin who was saying yes, it is so, and we are even worse. You know, this is the NGO scene and the people who are trying to get funding from the West. Um, and you know uh, there are people like uh, let's say Emir Kusturica who replied with this kind of uh, parodic over identification of these stereotypes and actually trying to <coughs> in filmic uh, imagination even outdo it and show how even more violent they are than they are portrayed and so on. So there there were you know different ways of responding. Um, and in Russia, of course, it was exactly the opposite. Right? It was uh, you know Serbs were seen as basically. So the heroes are under attack by the West, and so, you know, of course, in the Russian context, they were used as kind of these freedom fighters against the West. And look, this is an example of what you know can possibly happen to us as well, and so on and so forth. So I think it's exactly the opposite, uh, you know, because I think even Milosevic during um, the first months of NATO bombing tried to enter this union between Russia, Belarus, and, um, and Serbia kind of weird, without any contiguous boundaries <laughs> between Serbia and Russia, but it, it, it was kind of an attempt um, to do so. So I know you probably know better how it was in Russia, if you follow that. Somehow. Somehow. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, I'm really interested in the Russian context, and I'm What is her name? Is it Dina Jordana? Dina, Dina Hapaiva. Hapaiva. You know, I don't know her work, so I'm going to have to look it up. It's called um, The Teacher's Care Obstacle. The first one and the second one was Literatura e Gizni. Something about Kashmar. Oh, okay. Look it up on the And my second question um, deals with the final part of the presentation where you spoke about the use of the vampire mm -hmm. in the contemporary tourist industry. <laughs> So um, since, as you said, we see so many vampire imagery now in the contemporary mm -hmm. Western world, right? For example, we see have Vampire Diaries, we have Twilight Saga, and most of those contemporary, contemporary vampires seem to descend directly from Bram Stoker mm -hmm. and not from the 
for God, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So, uh, do you think that by doing so, mm -hmm. third Sunday Baptists in general may try to appropriate the mess that was mm -hmm. taken from them? So, what's your take on that? Yeah, that, that's a very, very good point. I think that they're trying to find, you know, resources to, you know, uh, survive somehow, especially in these smaller villages and, you know, place, places in, uh, on the coast and so on. And I think the first attempt was in Romania, actually, you know, because of the Transylvanian, um, you know, connection with, you know, Bram Stoker, you know, mentioning that Transylvania is the home of the vampire. And they were actually planning to build a theme park called Dracula Land. Uh, that was supposed to be in Transylvania, but because of the, you know, terrain, because it was mountainous, they decided to move it next to the Bucharest airport. But then in the meantime, the regime changed and, you know, they, you know, abandoned the project uh, and it, it never basically got, got built. But it was kind of an interesting attempt to reclaim it, you know, for sort of for themselves. But I don't think that the, this is very serious reclaiming, you know, it is kind of business driven you know, sort of decision, you know, to use any means possible to attract some sort of tourism or some sort of, uh, you know, revenue, you know, to these passive regions, basically, you know, I think. Yeah. And in Croatia, it's very interesting, you know, because the Istria in Croatia is this Jure Grando, and, you know, I, with my study abroad students, we go there every time, and they have a vampire bar, um, you know, in the middle of this medieval village, you know, it's very tiny, um, and the priests and the local, yeah, and I am studying every year how the priests and the local community are so much set against them. And they're saying like, you don't do this, you don't talk about it. Uh, villages won't talk about it because they're still superstitious. They think it can bring it back if they talk about it. Um, but this younger generation, they, they don't care, you know. And their idea, of course, it is that they organize vampire shows for the tourists. Um, which consists basically, you know, in, in the girls in halter tops, like six of them and one vampire in a cape, you know, going around and like biting the tourists, you know, <laughs> quote unquote. But it's kind of more like a, uh, you know, soft sex show. You know. It's very interesting, you know, what they think vampires, uh, you know, are. I would say that like the, the majority of the population is sort of in between, but very much apolitical and turned off by politics in general. And uh, that they all see that they're caught in between these camps, so these kind of hungry vampires on all sides, you know, so to speak. And what nation isn't really, if you think about it, um, but you, you just, it's just more visible in smaller environments. When I think of my adopted homeland, the United States, I mean, I see like a lot of like, parallels nowadays, you know, uh, with the sort of the rise of the Tea Party and people who want to abolish everything and like work for the well-being of the you know top one percent and so on. It's sort of this, the whole thing kind of just perpetuates itself, and we have kind of this almost uh, coming through of Marxist you know prophecy. That's why I kind of put Marx. Although I was like all my life was trying to escape Marxism and Marxists, you know, and kind of coming back to them in a very uncanny manner. It's sort of strange. Um, It seems that they are much more like concerned with the sort of the gay population than with vampires. 
Well, it is very funny because, you know, the vampire during the Lord By Byron's time, vampire with a Y, was a code word for, for, for the homosexuals in, 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 in England. <laughs> so, who knows you know, what it is? But, you know, um, I, I really don't know. I, I think that, you know, um, in the 19th century, I do know, you know, in the 19th century, um, you know, the, the church very much did not like the fact that people were on their own trying to hire uh, these kind of vampire killers, you know, and when they noticed that there is something going on, they would invite him, pay him, vampirji, you know, they're called, and they're sometimes thought of being half, you know, um, you know, the, the products of the marriage between the vampire and a woman, normal woman. It's kind of interesting. So these guys were, you know, had a kind of profession, and the church was very much against that. They wanted, of course, to control the symbolic domain of the border between life and death and not allow the, this kind of new entrepreneurial class of, to, to, to grow. It's kind of interesting. Uh, if I may have a follow-up question. Yes. Uh, That's a very, very good issue, you know, because it seems that, that, that this is how this kind of whole mechanism for, you know, crimes that are committed and then you pick certain, let's say, metonymic figures, let's call them, you know, that, that are going to make scapegoats for it and then supposedly once they're, you know, brought to trial and, you know, then the whole nation is washed of their sins. Uh, but um, interesting thing that he was never, he died before he could be brought to justice. So it's kind of interesting, it's unfinished business. He wasn't properly staked, so to speak. <laughs> so, so the evil continues. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, you know, this sign, what does it mean, you know? That's because, you know, his party is now, you know, has a prime minister in power who was like one of the worst apparatchiks, uh, you know, that was universally hated in the opposition movement, and now he's the prime minister. Um, and we have the, you know, Grober in chief for the, right. the grave digger of the president. By definition, vampire. Who's going to bury Serbia basically, maybe properly for once, and yeah. not exist anymore. I don't know. Well, there is no questions, but I do thank you very much. Thank you very much.